In this video, we are going to talk about the ancient Greek religion. The religion in ancient Greece was extremely important and affected literally every aspect of Greek life. It was polytheistic and encompassed several gods. The religion of the Greek classical period likely incorporated elements that go all the way back to the Bronze Age and perhaps even further into the Stone Age. But always the question is just how far back. There is quite a bit of evidence that religious worship existed in the Stone Age. Some of the earliest graves found outside of Greece have been dated as far back as 100,000 years ago. Burial of the dead shows a respect for the deceased. Whether this was part of a religious practice is unknown. If religious worship existed during the Stone Age, it is difficult to prove without a written history. Also, the lack of communication in the Stone Age would have made it difficult to start large-scale religions. It isn't until the introduction of agriculture, around 10,000 BC, that brings larger groups of people together. One thing that has been proven is that religious worship was practiced by the two main civilizations in the Bronze Age, the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. The deciphering of the Linear B scripts proves some tantalizing details, because the names of several gods from the Classical Greek period appear on Linear B tablets. The three main names found were Zeus, Athena, and Poseidon. Now, are these the same gods that appear 1,000 years later in Classical Greece? Well, the best case can be made for Poseidon. The problem, however, is that Poseidon is a different god during the Bronze Age. Poseidon is a terrestrial god rather than his famous classical association with the sea. So what does all this mean? How many of the classical Greek religious traditions came down from the Bronze Age? Well, the names are likely not just a mere coincidence. They point to some continuity from the Bronze Age through the Dark Ages to the Archaic and then finally the Classical Greek period. The problem is the Greek religion through pottery and literature traces its beginnings only back to the 8th century, but nothing before that time period. Now, as we know, Mycenaean civilization collapsed around 1200 BC. After that, the Greek mainland enters a period known as the Greek Dark Ages. The Greek Dark Ages lasted around three to four centuries, so there is about a 400-year gap between Bronze Age Greece and the Archaic Greek period that followed it. And of course, it is around the Archaic Greek period where the first archaeological remains of the Greek religion were discovered. Is it possible that some of the Bronze Age traditions and rituals made it through this period? thus connecting Bronze Age Greece with Classical Greece? Certainly. But again, in the absence of written history from the Bronze Age, it is hard to prove this definitively. You can find certain pieces and statues, but without an accompanying written history, it is difficult to prove exact dates. So what does all this mean? Well, I think the best way to think of this is that the Greek religion started anew in the 8th century. But there were undoubtedly some influences from Bronze Age Greece, and perhaps that stretches even farther back into the Stone Age. The ancient Greek religion seems to have had no single founder. For instance, Christianity was founded by Jesus Christ and Islam by Muhammad. Instead, the ancient Greek religion is understood through poets, myths, pottery, and numerous inscriptions that have been found. The most important contributions come from two poets, Homer and Hesiod. They are often credited with establishing Greek religious customs. Homer through the Iliad and Hesiod through his works The Theogony. The Theogony describes the origins and genealogies of the Greek gods. Inscriptions also provide evidence of religious practice and rituals. They provide a wealth of information on many aspects of the ancient Greek religion. Despite this, the overall religion remains very complicated. Although the Greeks worshipped a common set of deities, each city often developed their own local traditions. Now, in terms of the deities, the most important gods in ancient Greece were the Olympian gods. They were established by the works of Homer. The Olympians were so named because of their residency atop Mount Olympus. According to legend, they gained their supremacy in a 10-year war against the Titans. The 12 Olympians were led by Zeus, who was the Sky Father. And you will recognize many names in this list. Athena, Poseidon, Hermes. Now the 12th god is Hestia. Hestia used to be one of the Olympians, but the constant fighting and bickering between the gods annoyed her, and she eventually gave up her seat to the god of wine. Dionysus. Even though she left the consul, Hestia still kept a home on Mount Olympus. Hestia was not considered to be a very significant god in Greek mythology. In fact, Hestia is completely omitted from the works of Homer. Now let's take a look at temples and sanctuaries. Today, the most outwardly sign remaining of the ancient Greek religion is the temple. Temples were usually built on a sanctuary or sacred site. The temple was dedicated to a specific god and often contained a statue of the deity. 
An altar was usually placed in front of the temple, where sacrifices and rituals could be performed. Easily the most famous and recognizable Greek temple is the Parthenon, which was dedicated to the goddess Athena. The Athenians made Athena their patron. Sparta also chose Athena as their patron god. Corinth, however, chose Poseidon as their patron god. Now a distinction should be made between the land of the sanctuary and the temple itself. The land was considered to be owned by the god to whom the sanctuary was dedicated to. The sanctuaries were almost always older than the temples themselves. In fact, many sanctuaries didn't even have a temple. The creation of the temple seems to have been a later development as cities grew and became more prosperous. Water also had an important role inside sanctuaries. Many sanctuaries contained fountains and even freshwater springs. This was important especially for anyone who traveled to the sanctuary. Water would be made available to visitors and even their animals. Sanctuaries often contained a sacred grove of trees, and there was usually a single special tree. For instance, near the Parthenon was an important olive tree. Legend has it that Zeus started a contest between Athena and Poseidon for possession of Athens. Poseidon created a salt spring, while Athena produced an olive tree. The Athenians chose Athena's gift, and the olive tree became a central part of their life. Leaves were often picked from the tree and used to crown the heads of victorious generals and kings. The olives themselves became a staple in the Mediterranean diet and a valuable export throughout antiquity. Fire also played a significant role, and therefore many temples contained a hearth. In fact, it was so important that many temples maintained an eternal fire. Delphi also kept an eternal fire. Many city-states throughout Greece would send delegations to retrieve and bring back the fire to their domain. As I mentioned earlier, altars were usually placed in front of the temple. The altar often stood out in the open air, and the temple opened up towards it. The altar was usually constructed out of stone, and these would have been large stone blocks. Often there was a set of stairs leading up to the altar. It was here that sacrifices took place, as well as any libations that were required during the ritual. The Greek religion for the most part did not include full-time priests that we see in many other ancient religions. For instance, ancient Rome maintained organized priesthoods with different colleges. In ancient Greece, however, anyone could lead a ceremony, but usually the role of priests were delegated to an important person within the city. For example, the kings of Sparta often led religious ceremonies. By the way, the temple depicted in this illustration is the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. Inside the temple was the statue of Zeus, which was 43 feet tall. The sculpture was made out of ivory plates and gold panels. The statue has since been lost to history, and the circumstances of its destruction are unknown. Now let's take a look at divination. Divination is the practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the unknown through supernatural means. Both oracles and seers in ancient Greece practiced divination. Oracles were the conduits for the gods on earth. Their prophecies were understood to be the will of the gods. Seers, on the other hand, were not in direct contact with the gods. Instead, they were interpreters of signs provided by the gods. Seers examined omens sent by the gods through birds, animal entrails, and other methods. There were far more seers in ancient Greece than there were oracles. The disadvantage to seers was that they could only answer yes or no questions. Oracles, on the other hand, could answer more generalized questions. So as I mentioned, it was the seer's duty to read the signs as they appeared. The signs could potentially provide a good or bad omen of the future. It should be noted that most signs originated from Zeus himself. Now, what were these signs? These could literally be anything, perhaps a bolt of lightning or an eclipse. A thunderstorm. The most important omens involved the flight paths of birds. It is also important to note that a sign usually was a simple yes or no. It's a good omen or it's a bad omen. They told you little else about the actual outcome. But if a god provided you a good omen, that generally meant the outcome was probably going to go your way. Good and bad signs could affect the course of a war or battle. A favorable omen often led a general to seek battle. However, an unfavorable omen meant the army would remain in camp until a positive sign occurred. Since seers could travel anywhere, they often accompanied an army on the march. Now let's talk about oracles. Oracles were usually attached to a sanctuary or temple. The most famous, of course, is the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle of Delphi was the mouthpiece for the god Apollo. The Delphic Oracle exerted considerable influence throughout the Hellenic culture. The Oracle was a female and was considered to be the highest religious authority in ancient Greece. She responded to all kinds of questions, but usually they involved issues concerning politics and war. It was not uncommon for foreign dignitaries to visit the Oracle, since she was famous throughout the ancient world. 
As I mentioned before, oracles were the conduits for the gods on earth. Their prophecies were understood to be the will of the gods. Usually the god would speak to the oracle from a medium which varied from oracle to oracle. The oracle of Delphi was believed to communicate to Apollo through volcanic flames that rose up from the earth. The oracle, surrounded by the rising vapors, would fall into a trance. The oracle would then elicit strange utterances, which were transcribed by nearby priests. By the way, Delphi was considered to be the center of the Greek world. Legend has it that Zeus released two eagles, one from the west and one from the east, and they eventually met at Delphi. Now let's examine religious practice in ancient Greece. First, let's review animal sacrifice. One of the most pious acts in ancient Greece involved animal sacrifice. Goats and sheep were often the animal of choice. One of the most prized sacrificial animals was the bull. Now, typically, a procession would escort the animal up to the altar. In addition, the animal was typically adorned with garlands and other items. It was not uncommon for the procession to have music. Before the animal was sacrificed, a prayer would have been recited. The sacrificial animal was then killed by either a knife or an axe. The blood from the animal was then collected and poured over the altar. A bloody altar was an important theme. The entire sacrifice would have been followed according to a very concise ritual. After the sacrifice was completed, some of the meat was burned as an offering to the gods. The rest would have been consumed in a feast. The feast in turn was often accompanied by a libation. As I mentioned before, the bull was considered to be one of the most prized animals in terms of animal sacrifice. The main reason for this was the bull's close association with Zeus. Stags were associated with Apollo and goats with Hermes. The owl was closely associated with Athena. The overall goal of a sacrifice accomplished many things. First and foremost, it maintained a good relationship with the gods. Also, the Greeks hoped to receive something special by magical means that they would not otherwise accomplish in normal life. Now let's take a look at rituals. The religious ritual is a sequence of activities involving acts, words, and objects, performed in a sequestered place and performed according to a set sequence. So, for instance, animal sacrifices were often done according to a very strict ritual. Everyone involved in the sacrifice would have been assigned a specific role and function. Libations were also very important in ancient Greece. Libations involved a drink poured out as an offering to a deity. The most common drink offered was wine, but libations could also involve olive oil, honey, and even water. Libations could be performed by the simplest of events to the most important. For instance, before a symposium started, the first vase of wine was offered to Zeus. Libations often went hand in hand with prayers. Before a sea voyage, a prayer was made for safe passage. A libation would then be poured into the sea as an offering. Greeks often provided gifts to the gods. One of the most common gifts were food offerings. So for instance, after a successful harvest was concluded, a portion of the food might be offered to the gods. Other items such as fruit, bread, olives, and wine were also gifted to the gods. Many times this equated to a first offering. So, for instance, if fruit was picked from the trees, a small portion would be donated to the gods first before any of the fruit was consumed. Sometimes these food offerings were left or even burned on the altar dedicated to the god in question. As always, this helped maintain a good relationship with the gods. Other items could be donated to the gods as well. It was not uncommon for victors in wars to leave some of the spoils won inside the temple. These gifts were considered pleasing to the gods. Now let's talk about purification. Being pure was very, very important to the ancient Greeks. It was considered offensive to the gods to enter a sanctuary or temple in a state of uncleanliness. Water was the most common way to achieve purity. And this is also another reason why many sanctuaries were situated near a source of water, such as a lake or river. If a source of water wasn't located nearby, vases of water were made available by the sanctuary so people could wash themselves. Priests also were expected to maintain a level of purity. They would fast and avoid sex before an important religious event or festival. There were also rituals that involved a purification process. For instance, if an event or disturbance happened that was considered to be impure, a ritual was required for purification purposes. Sometimes this involved a person intentionally defiling themselves in dirty clothes. The person was then cleansed with water and provided clean clothes. After the purification ritual was complete, balance was restored with the gods. And this is what this is all about. It was important to restore order with the gods. By the way, water was not the only method of purification. Fire was an important method of purification. 
In addition, music was considered important. It was thought to be a cure for madness. In many religions, it is common to kneel down in prayer. However, this was not as common in ancient Greece. Instead, a supplicant would raise his arms to the sky and recite the prayer. If the individual was invoking Poseidon, they would extend their arms out to the sea. Now let's take a look at festivals. Numerous religious festivals were held in ancient Greece. Festivals covered many different aspects of the ancient Greek culture, and they would have been dedicated to a specific god. Some of the most important festivals were athletic and music competitions. The most famous ancient Greek festival were the Olympic Games. The games were dedicated to Zeus. During the celebration of the games, wars and battles were strictly prohibited. This made it possible for athletes to travel from their cities to the games in relative safety. The games were often used as a political tool by many city-states. It was not uncommon to form alliances at competitions. Festivals typically opened with a procession that was followed by sacrifices, which in turn was followed by a huge feast. In addition, every ancient Greek festival almost always involved dancing and singing. The instrument of choice was usually the flute. Now let's take a look at some various tidbits. Those who were not satisfied by the mainstream Greek religion could turn to various mystery religions which operated as cults. The only way you could learn about the cult's secrets was to join the order. The mysteries provided offerings that the mainstream religion could not offer. For instance, the Eleusian mysteries provided a reward in the afterlife. Mysteries were mostly local traditions, but some spread to different areas around Greece. Now, when the Roman Republic conquered Greece in 146 BC, it copied much of the Greek religion. After Christianity came to dominate the Roman religion, the Roman Emperor Theodosius in 392 abolished paganism. This effectively eliminated the last remnants of the ancient Greek religion. 